my wife and I were sitting on the front porch. It had been a long day of moving furniture and boxes into our new house. We were tired, red-faced, and sweating after sharing the burden between the two of us. The sun was setting on the horizon as we sipped warm beers and looked out over the landscape of our newly acquired ranch. Fields stretched off into the distance as far as the eye could see, not a neighbor in sight for miles. The cows were grazing, looking unhappy, their tails hanging straight down as they ignored the fresh grass all around them. I figured they were just upset from the long move. Why do you think they needed so many locks? My wife asked, taking a sip of her beer. It was the elephant in the room, so to speak, and I had to admit I was curious about it as well. Every door in the house had a deadbolt on it, inside and out. Not only that, but the windows were shielded by thick iron bars. The old owners had left long before we could ask them about it. Eh, folks who lived here before were probably shut-ins, you know? Hermits like your Uncle Steve. I joked. She laughed at the gentle barb. Yvette's uncle rarely left his house, unless it was for a fresh case of beer. We'll take them down and I'll fill the screw holes in with wood putty. Paint them over and they'll look good as new. You want to redo the trim anyway. And the bars on the windows? That'll take a bit more work, but I can get it done before the weekend. I'll just have to run over to the hardware store to grab a few things. Can't find some of my tools. Maybe they got lost during the move. My wife was no longer paying attention. She was now staring at some point far off in the distance. What's that? She asked, pointing. I followed her finger and looked to see a gray shape moving in the fields. At first I thought it was wild dog or a coyote, but no. It was too large for that. This was a wolf, and a big one. It seemed to be stalking deliberately toward us, marching at a steady, quick pace. It came up to our split rail fence and did the strangest thing. Instead of leaping over it or burrowing under it as I'd expected, it stood up on two legs like a person, ducked, and stepped through the middle of the two logs, one leg after the other. It was exactly how I would have done it. Once it was on the other side, it went back on four legs and started its progress toward us again. Then it looked up and saw us staring at it. The gray wolf stayed still for a few seconds, then disappeared in the tall grass suddenly. It was just gone. It didn't dive into the grass or duck down. It was there, and then a moment later it was gone. Vanished in the blink of an eye. The two of us sat uneasily on the porch, and I stood up to look in the distance, trying to spot the creature, but it was nowhere to be found. I'm going inside. You should come too, my wife said, sounding nervous. We went in and locked the doors at the front and back of the house. The bars stayed on the windows after that, and my wife didn't mention the deadbolts on the doors again either. The two of us went to bed that night with little talk between us. A big difference from the ecstatic chatter that had been the norm all day prior to the event with the wolf. Or whatever that thing was. I got the feeling wolf was not quite the right word. It was something else. That night, something even more disturbing happened to us both. I woke up in the early hours of the morning, around 3.30 a.m. according to the bedside alarm clock. When I looked next to me in the bed and saw my wife's spot was empty, I became immediately concerned for her safety. Where could she have gone at this time of night, I wondered. And that was when I heard her voice calling to me from outside the window, asking insistently for me to let her in. Her cries for help were muffled through the glass, and I lifted the heavy old window pane up to hear her better. What are you doing out there? I asked, worried about the wolf we'd seen earlier. I was looking around for glowing eyes, reflecting the moonlight nearby. Standing on two legs or four, I wasn't sure which to expect. I must have been sleepwalking, she said dreamily. The front door locked behind me somehow. You have to let me back in. Please, it's cold out here. I'll be right down, I said, 
without thinking about how impossible all of that was. I was only concerned for her safety at that moment, and she had been known to sleepwalk occasionally, so that part seemed to make sense. I raced down the stairs in my boxers and grasped the front doorknob in my hand, turning it. Thankfully, it was locked, or who knows what might have happened. Reaching up to turn the lock, I was startled to hear a voice behind me. What are you doing? My wife asked. I jumped at the sound, my heartbeat quickening. But what terrified me even more was what I had just seen outside. Given the time frame it had taken me to get downstairs, it was impossible that it had been her. It was like someone else had been out there, wearing her skin and speaking in her voice. Was there an imposter outside, or... Or was this the imposter standing in front of me? Looking at the woman before me, the caring expression on her face, I suddenly had no doubt it was my wife, Yvette. Panting, I walked over to her and hugged her tightly. What's wrong? She asked. I didn't answer, afraid she would think I was losing my mind. Some things we don't speak of with anyone. Not even our significant others. We take them to our grave. Afraid that if we tell of these things out loud, it will make them true. And will make the source of the impossible things return. So instead I just took her hand and led her up the stairs. Looking back nervously over my shoulder at the front door. Waiting for the sound of a key turning in the lock. Or the sound of it being broken down by powerful forces outside my control. Instead, there was a gentle knock polite at first. But then the fist began to pound against the front door of the house louder and louder, more and more insistently. My wife stopped, turning around to look at me on the stairs. Who is that? she asked nervously. At this time of night? Just ignore it. Let's, let's go to bed. They'll go away. Eventually. We're safe in here. After a few moments of hesitation, she turned around and began going up the stairs once more, taking a couple nervous looks back as she did. We kept walking up the stairs as the pounding continued, devolving into steady scratching noises that didn't cease until daybreak. What were you doing down in the basement last night? My wife asked at the breakfast table the next morning. Neither one of us mentioned the sounds at the door the night before. We were both trying to act like it never happened. In the light of the morning, it seemed like a shared hallucination. A bad dream brought on by warm beer and too much time in the sun moving boxes without assistance. In the basement? I wasn't in the basement, I told her. Sure you were. You were calling my name, asking me to come down there. I looked at her with concern. When was this? Right before I found you at the front door. I figured I just missed you, that you found whatever you were looking for down in the basement and went to the kitchen for a snack or something. But then I found you by the front door. I was never in the basement last night. She looked at me, puzzled. Of course you were. Who else would have been calling for me down there? I debated telling her what I had seen outside and decided I probably should. We were clearly dealing with something very strange here and we needed to be on the same team if we were going to figure it out. Yvette, did you go outside at all last night? No, what does that have to do with... Okay, so here's the thing. I saw you outside. At the same time when you were going down to the basement, you were calling at me from the front door, telling me you were sleepwalking and you were locked out. That's why I was at the door. I, I never went down to the basement, and I don't think that was really you outside either. I think there's something else causing all this to happen. What the hell could cause that to happen? I opened my mouth to answer when there was a polite rapping at the door. The two of us sat dead silent for a few moments, unsure what to do. The knocking came again, and I heard a man's voice muffled through the door saying, There's a car here. Maybe they're out in the fields. Should we just leave it on the doorstep? A woman's voice asked. I don't like being here any more than you do, but that seems a bit rude. Maybe we should come back. 
Yvette and I both stood up, sensing that this was not the same entity from the night before. I don't know how I could tell, but I just could. This wasn't an evil presence, it was just some neighbors coming by to welcome us. And they sounded like they might know something more than we did about the ranch and its mysteries. I opened the front door and saw a man and a woman with their backs turned, walking away from us. They spun around when they heard the sound of the door opening up. Oh, hi there, we're the Turnbulls. Uh, we live down the road, technically next door, as if there is such a thing out here. Uh, but we do share an easement with you to access the river. Jack takes the cattle down that way sometimes for a change of scenery. The man put his arm around his wife's shoulder and whispered something in her ear. She abruptly stopped talking, realizing that she was rambling on nervously. Oh, come on now, Diane, I'm sure they don't want to get into all that. Look, we just wanted to stop by and welcome you to the neighborhood, so to speak. It's nice to have another couple living next door again. This place has been empty for so long. My wife and I looked at each other with surprise. As far as we knew, the place had been occupied right up until our arrival. It hadn't shown signs of disrepair or neglect, so we'd had no reason to think otherwise. Really? No wonder this place was such a bargain. How long was it empty for? The man and woman shared a look. Oh, you know, not that long. A few years. Anyways, we just wanted to bring you this casserole. We have a few errands to run, but it was nice meeting you both. Come on by our place anytime. We're number 56981. Next driveway up on your side, that way. The man said, hooking his thumb eastward. I had never seen anyone introduce themselves and run so quickly. I tried not to take it personally. It was so nice meeting you both, the woman said, taking a few quick steps towards my wife and handing her the casserole dish. You can keep that, by the way. It's Pyrex. Great for casseroles. She backed up to join her husband, looking around the property nervously as she did. Hey, can I ask you something? The two of them looked ready to run back to their car, but they stopped and nodded, shifting on their feet anxiously and waiting for me to speak. Have you guys ever seen anything... Uh, how should I put this? There's been a few weird occurrences since we moved in, and I was just wondering if you could tell us anything. Is this place haunted? Is that why it was so cheap? Look, I can tell you guys are nervous. Just, just give us something to work with, please. We're getting a little freaked out here. The woman looked pleadingly at her husband. He nodded to her, and she went back to the car and got in the passenger seat, where she sat darting her eyes from side to side. What exactly did you see? The man asked. Wait, no, don't tell me. It's better if we don't speak of them. They know when you talk about them. It's better if we don't. Well, then, how do we get rid of them? You don't. These things have been around a lot longer than you or me. My wife and I get our share of strange events on the ranch next door, too, but not as bad as here. This place, well, there's something here that makes it special. Not in a good way, I'm sorry to say. I'd tell you more, but it would only make things worse. It always does. There was a sound of knuckles rapping against the glass, and I looked to see his wife banging on the car window looking with wide eyes at us and pointing into the distance, toward the fields. My eyes followed where she was pointing, and I looked to see the large gray wolf was back, and it was moving towards us again. I told you, we're not meant to speak of them. I need to go. The two of you should decide soon if you want to stay. This place changes you. It will take things from you. You only get so long to decide. If you wait to see what the changes will be, it will already be too late. Trust me. With that, he turned away and went back to his car. He started the engine and drove off much quicker than I would have thought safe on a dirt driveway, swerving and leaving a cloud of dust hanging in the air around us, obstructing my view for a few seconds. When I turned around again, the wolf in the field was much, much closer. It was about 50 yards away and closing in fast, it was looking at me intently. My wife was running back towards the house, yelling at me to come, but I was frozen now, watching the wolf as it stood on its hind legs again. Not a wolf. Stop calling it a wolf. It's not a wolf. It's just trying to fool you into thinking that's what it is, but it's so much more dangerous than that. I tried to take a step, but my legs wouldn't budge. 
My eyes were locked on the wolf as it began to stalk towards me. No longer an animal, but something else wearing an animal suit. The ancient, leathery-skinned humanoid beneath the wolf armor could be glimpsed occasionally as it strode like a hunter in my direction, taking long steps moving low to the ground. The fur pieces were simply strapped onto it like clothing. The wolf head strapped on like a hat. What are you doing? Get in here! My wife yelled one more time, and my foot suddenly started to move. As soon as it did, I found I was unfrozen and finally able to start running, and not a second too soon. The house was close, but the thing was fast. When it saw me beginning to run, it became a wolf again in an instant. The idea that it was anything but that seemed ludicrous. As I watched it race toward me on all fours, its snapping jaws dripping saliva as it dove to cut me off. This thing was a massive gray wolf through and through. It could be nothing but that. And yet my eyes had begged otherwise just a moment before. If not for my wife, it might have gotten me. But she saw what was happening and took a large rock we had been using as a doorstop and threw it straight at the thing's head. It missed, hitting the beast in the shoulder instead, but it was enough to drive it back for a brief second. Which was all I needed. I ran into the house and slammed the door shut behind me. An instant later, the scratching began again. Soon there was another one at the back door, scratching it as well. The sounds continued for hours. When the noises stopped and I finally ventured outside again, I found that three of the cattle had been killed. The others were scared out of their wits, hiding huddled together in a corner of the field near the house. Their eyes darted around, reminding me of how the neighbors had looked as they scanned our property for things lurking in the shadows. I was beginning to suspect we were not going to be able to stay in this place much longer. Even if we could survive, this was no way to live. That night, my wife and I sat in the living room with all the blinds and curtains drawn, discussing what we would do. The house wouldn't sell quickly. That much was obvious based on the neighbor's statements. The two of us decided we would leave in the morning regardless. We would stay in a motel until we found an apartment to rent, sacrificing all of our investment in the house. Even if we put it up for sale again, it would be a long, long time before we made any portion of our money back. But it was too dangerous and too terrifying to stay. I'm going to bed, my wife said, looking tired. Come upstairs soon, okay? I don't want to be alone. I'll be up in a minute, I told her. I just want to grab a glass of water. She nodded sleepily and went up the stairs slowly, looking depressed. We had dreamed about this move for so long, and now it was all coming to ruins. I felt sad about it, too. I went to the kitchen and poured a glass of water. After drinking it down in one long gulp, I decided I needed another. It had been a hell of a day, and I'd been too distracted to drink anything. A noise came from upstairs. A scraping sound, like claws. Setting down the glass, I turned around and listened closely. Yvette? She didn't reply. I took a few steps across the linoleum floor of the kitchen before calling out again. Once again, there was no answer. By the time I got to the bottom of the stairs, my heart was pounding so fast and hard I felt like it would beat right out of my chest. I opened my mouth to call her name once more when I saw it. The wolf that wasn't a wolf strode on two legs across the gap at the top of the stairs, then disappeared around the corner, heading towards my wife. It was so quick that I thought for a moment I could have imagined it. Just a gray blur that was gone in an instant. If not for the fact that it looked down the stairs at me and smiled, its long canines gleaming in the light, its eyes, pure blackness. I ran up the stairs as fast as I could, terrified of what it would do to her. When I got to the second floor, I looked down the hall to see all the doors were closed. It was as if the whole thing had really just been my imagination. Taking an unsteady step towards the bedroom, my heartbeat did not slow down even slightly. My hand was shaking as I reached for the doorknob, turning it and entering the master bedroom. I entered hesitantly, finding the room dark and my wife asleep in bed. 
Part of me wanted to wake her up, but for some reason I didn't. It will be fine. Just go to bed, my irrational thoughts said. My pounding heart began to slow, and my eyelids grew heavy. This is fine, my mind told me. Everything is fine. Just go to sleep now. Trying not to think of what I had seen just moments before, I climbed into bed, getting in next to my wife and shivering while my body warmed up beneath the sheets. There was a soft sound of padding footsteps outside the bedroom door, and then a scratching sound. Something wants to get inside the bedroom, and a strange, foreign voice in my mind is telling me to let it in. The story you just heard was written by me, and a variation of it previously featured on the Dr. No Sleep podcast and YouTube channel. If you'd like to check out their channel for more content, please check out the description below. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. If you'd like another way to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, you'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story, just like these fine folks. Many have already been featured in a story taking place in the strange and supernatural town of Hollow's End. If you haven't watched it yet, check out the Hollow's End playlist on my channel. I'm really proud of it, and I think it's some of the best stuff I've written so far. My favorite part has been coming up with characters for members and using their suggestions as a jumping off point. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.